Well, I think that was a very uh, dynamic um, and interactive poster session uh, upstairs. And we just uh, kindly ask uh, people to uh, quietly take their uh, seats. And um, we will kind of commence with our, uh, our keynote uh, address in a, in a, in a few uh, in a few moments. So again, it's my uh, uh, distinct honor to uh, welcome Professor Alan Lumsden to Toronto as our 2023 Gordon Murray uh, uh, lecturer. And I'll, I'll go over um, Dr. Lumsden's impressive resume in just a few uh, moments, but he holds the Walter W. Fondren III Distinguished Endowed Chair and is a medical director at the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And this is really, even for a neurosurgeon, one of the iconic uh, cardiovascular centers um, uh, in, the, uh, um, in, 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 the, in the in the world. So a little bit about uh, Gordon Murray. Uh, so I had a smile this morning because one of the uh, AV technologists uh, asked me if I was Gordon Murray, and I said, no, I don't think so. Uh, this is Gordon Murray as a, as a young man, and then later um, uh, when he uh, received the Order of Canada. <clears throat> so Gordon Murray was born in 1897. Um, he was uh, educated um, at medical school uh, in Toronto. He uh, uh, served gallantly in the first uh, World uh, 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 War, and then subsequently came on faculty at the Toronto General uh, Hospital. I have a slight connection with uh, Gordon Murray through uh, my mentor, uh, Charles Tatter, who was, um, I believe, an intern uh, on Gordon Murray's uh, service, if I uh, recall uh, uh, correctly. And Gordon Murray, uh, as far as I understand, was an extremely accomplished uh, distinguished, uh, technically gifted surgeon. Probably best known, uh, interestingly, for the clinical applications of, of heparin. I actually did some research into the, into the discovery of, of heparin, and there was actually a connection with Charles Best, a co-discoverer of insulin, and this was purified at the Connaught uh, Laboratories um, in Toronto, and uh, Gordon Murray uh, really was very proactive in, in the use of this. And then the uh, Gordon Murray lectureship was endowed in 1981. And um, until very recently, uh, uh, Ros Bradford, who is um, Gordon Murray's uh, a, a daughter, would, would, be, would be here. And we would have the, uh, the pleasure of her uh, company uh, as well. But for health reasons, uh, Ros is no longer able to, uh, uh, to join us. And so this is a, a bit of the history of uh, Gordon uh, of Gordon Murray. So a little bit about uh, Alan uh, um, uh, 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 Lumsden. So he has the coolest uh, uh, accent, which is part Scotsman, and he was uh, born uh, in this little town, which is midway between uh, Edinburgh and uh, and Glasgow in in Scotland. And he did his undergraduate uh, medical training at the University of, of Edinburgh. And then, for interesting reasons, he decided to go to the to the states um, and went to uh, uh, Emory uh, University. And that's the element of the southern twang in uh, Professor Lumsden's um, uh, um, uh, multifaceted uh, uh, accent. And he did general surgery and then vascular surgery at Emory, and subsequently became the chief of the division of vascular surgery. And then in 2002, he was enticed to Baylor College of Medicine and to the Michael DeBakey Department of uh, Surgery at that uh, distinguished uh, center, and eventually became professor in chief of the Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy. And then um, uh, his career has evolved, and, and, and certainly uh, um, the Houston Methodist uh, Hospital also evolved and became professor and chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery in 2008. And he truly has an international reputation as a leader in cardiovascular surgery. I want to uh, thank and acknowledge uh, Professor Tom uh, uh, Forbes for the introduction to uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Alan, um, and we're really kind of we're brainstorming around you know uh, who would be a thought leader in the areas of uh, artificial intelligence and imaging and the applications of this, and and certainly this fits exactly uh, Professor Lumsden's 
uh, a background, and he's certainly um, a very distinguished. Oh, that's Roz Bradford, by the way, with me at uh, at, at 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 dinner, probably uh, quizzing me on my next year's choice for the uh, Gordon Murray um, uh, lecture. Can we go back to the slides? Um, uh, in any event, uh, uh, Professor Lumsden has an incredibly distinguished uh, curriculum vitae, hundreds of uh, peer-reviewed articles, several textbooks, NIH funding, world leader in, uh, in education, and uh, the DeBakey uh, Center um, has, a, has a remarkable reputation uh, internationally um, for uh, surgery research and, and education. So, so with that, um, with that uh, a background, uh, Professor Lumsden, we uh, would welcome you to give your address on imaging, imaging, and more imaging, how digital visualization is revolutionizing surgical care. Well, thank well, thank you indeed. Uh, Professor Feelings, Swallow, Forbes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. As I saw the list of people who had given this address before me, I wanted to run quite frequently. Uh, and I, as I heard the presentations this morning, I became more and more and more intimidated uh, by standing up here. <clears throat> um, as Professor Feeling said, I'm just a little guy from a little town in Whitburn, West Lothian. And I'm going to address the surgeon scientists here. I, again, this is a stunning uh, program and group of people that you've got here. And a lot of people will say to folks like us, how did you plan your career? Well, I didn't plan a damn thing, is the, is the short answer to this. And some people plan it out. I always just say, you get an opportunity, you go in there, you do a good job, you work hard, and you're nice to people, and doors open that you don't even know existed, quite honestly. And that's really been the story of my life, and being given opportunity after opportunity by people, basically, who I collaborated and worked with. The word surgeon scientist really, I thought you were thinking about it this morning, and I, I think this program must have an incredible influence uh, nationally and internationally. As a surgeon, it's, it's a very personal experience being given the privilege of operating on a patient and a patient being put to sleep and allowing you uh, to do things to them that you're really not that enthusiastic about. But you're not scalable as a surgeon. You can do one thing, and that's your obligation to do the best you can for that patient tomorrow. But you can't treat thousands of patients at the same time. That's the scientist part in what you folks are doing, in, in that you are looking at mechanisms, devices, and that is scalable. And it's so fundamentally important to have frontline practitioners influencing how that is going to occur. Otherwise, it will go off with device companies, pharmaceutical companies, without that kind of direction. And so I think what's been done here is to create something that will really revolutionize the delivery of care in all of these different surgical specialties. Now, I got a lot of titles up there. I've left them up there for a reason. We're real good at titles. We're not really good at paying for titles. So, so what we do, if we don't going to pay you more, we just give you a title. But some of them are kind of germane to what I'm going to talk about. And so. One of the things that is Mathurst, we built this thing called the Mathurst Institute for, for uh, Technology, Innovation, and Education. It started by Barbara Bass, actually, one of my predecessors, and it's a hands-on training center. Hands-on training centers, we have a lot of equipment in there, but it all doubles for device development. DeBakey Education was something that I started. We got a grant in town to build the most advanced cardiovascular training environment in the world. And I use the word cardiovascular. I'm a vascular surgeon, but I'm responsible for the heart and vascular center. That's kind of unusual, actually. And so we're responsible for, we work in the cardiovascular space. And DeBakey Education, you'll see me reference this multiple times. We, we are on hands-on symposium, but we built this YouTube channel. I think it's probably the biggest in the world. We'll hit 100,000 subscribers. 0.6% of YouTube channels, you know, have 100,000 subscribers. And we're competing with some pretty nasty looking YouTube channels that are out there. They've got millions of subscribers. And then the more recent thing, which come along, kind of, you'll see how this all fits in, is this idea of building the Mathurst Institute for Robotics, Imaging, and Navigation. We're flagrantly trying to copy the Hamlin Institute at Imperial College in London. We've always been powerful, basically, in the imaging standpoint. And that also is an interesting story, is that in the Heart and Vascular Center, we own the imaging. 
Uh, we basically have our own MRI scanner, so one of the reasons we had attract one of, one of your graduates, Trisha Roy, we have seven Tesla magnets, three Tesla magnets, PET. It's all basically housed inside the Heart and Vascular Center and run by clinicians, which we think is fundamentally important. It's imaging with purpose, as opposed to mass marketing imaging, basically, to get a report for a CAT scan. And all of these things basically come together and are going to be included to some extent in, in what I'm about to present to you. And some of these conflicts relate to that. We're the biggest Siemens install in the world. We have Siemens research scientists on site, fundamentally important to doing a lot of the things that we're doing. So let me tell you a little bit about imaging. And imaging means a lot of different things to different people, and everybody's going to be thinking about it differently. Anything you can see, we think of as imaging. You think of it as CT scans, MR. I really should have entitled this imaging and visualization, because this is all fundamentally important to us. We are users of it, but we don't teach how to optimize it. That's a big issue, is in the vascular surgery world. And why this is changing is going to affect everybody who practices surgery in this room, is the ability to take a picture. Think of the CT scan as your universe. It's you. Never get a CT scan in the hospital you work in. If you create surface rendering on it, you're on there. We just don't show it that way. We can see your face. We can see a lot more than your face. That's why you don't really want to have a CT scan in the institution that you're working in, because we can see your tattoos, your scars, your piercings, whatever is on there. The CT scan shows everything. We just tend not to look at it in that way. We look at it you know, from the point of view of cross-sectional black and white imaging. But the digitization allows that to be taken and moved. It can be moved into an operating room. It can be moved into the clinic. and can be used for creating VR environments, 3D printing, 3D VR modeling. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And at the end of the day, the reason we're interested in robotics, exquisite imaging can take you to a certain level. Robotics can take you to another level. What you will see is the convergence of imaging and robotics. And as long as we get that fusion correct, and that's pretty important, we can basically use targeted robotic input so they will move autonomously or you can block the robot out from moving into certain zones. So I think that the portability of segmentation just means that we take the piece we are interested in. I'm interested in blood vessels. You're all just as interested in the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder. Taking the pieces out that are relevant and using that basically to drive new ways of education, new ways of intervention, and that's kind of where we're going to go with this. And so this is really what we're going to see as we go forward is this new ways in which we, we're going to use that data. And I'm going to go through, if I get through all of this, it would be a miracle, but we'll try and talk about these various different uh, topics that, that are up here. And the other one I want to emphasize is the other, I call it the other guy's toolkit. And towards the end of my presentation, I'm going to talk about a meeting that we run in Houston, and that is with the oil and gas and the people from NASA. And we talk about that as the other guy's toolkit. What a, what a drilling engineer does is uses imaging. He navigates hollow tubes to a target. They just happen to be 5,000 feet underground and two miles away. They don't use x-rays. They don't get irradiated the way that we use x-rays. When you launch a vehicle, if it's, for example, SpaceX, they have a launch trajectory. You've got to put it inside a certain window. They're all using different types of imaging and navigation. And so although we are represented here by a number of different specialties, I can guarantee you, walk into somebody else's operating room, see the tools that they're using. A lot of the solutions to our individual problems are in somebody else's toolkit. We just don't get to see inside that toolkit you know, very often. So today I'm going to try and focus on something that I think cuts across basically almost all the surgical specialties. Can't be in Houston without talking about Dr. DeBakey. And Dr. DeBakey, this was his operating room. Um, next door was Dr. Denton Cooley. That was his operating room. And so to say that they competed would be we put in a mild way to say they even compete in the number of people you can jam in an operating room doesn't make much sense. I don't think the guy in the bottom left hand corner and Dr. Cooley's probably the educational uh, value of that. Not so good in trying to see what, what he's actually doing. But if you look at Dr. DeBakey and look up above his head, this was one of the original operating rooms. It was still there when I went down to Houston. There's a guy on a TV camera basically up above it. <laughs> And if you look up above, there were viewing domes. And those viewing domes only recently were removed, which is real pity, because uh, the highlight of people we toured through was to stand up there and watch the beating heart in the operating room down below. And so Dabiki was on the forefront, basically, of education. And when you think about, again, back to this topic of imaging and visualization, you're using your eyes, imaging. When you get to my age, you've got to wear, make sure you never walk away without the glasses. You can't read anything. 
Um, and then we used loop magnification. We used exascopes. We used endoscopes. And then we basically had this ability to put a scope inside a body cavity and to be able to see another form, basically, of visualization. And guess what? It's a digital signal that's really coming out the back end, which we can actually utilize. Now, if you're Superman, I'd like to be Superman. There's only one Superman in Houston. That is Dr. DeBakey. Uh, Superman basically had X-ray vision. We don't have X-ray vision. So at least in the vascular world, but in increasingly in other specialties, we have this ability to actually import imaging into the operating room. That is the fundamental shift that's occurring. It used to be imaging in a place called the radiology department. We had to go get permission uh, to use those, that imaging. But what's happening now is the portability and the ease of use is increasingly, imaging is now being put in the hands of the people who are actually doing the procedures. And that's the people who are in this audience. This was my operating room in Emory. <clears throat> We were very proud of that. That table we stole from the spine surgeons because it was supported above and below. It was completely radiolucent. Um, we thought this was great. Uh, and the real empowering technology for at least in the vascular surgery space was the development of these portable, real-time digital C-arms. Prior to that, I'm old enough to remember that the way we did a completion X-ray after we did the lower extremity bypass is you put an X-ray plate underneath the table. You waited 20 minutes for the x-ray tech to get there. And then you tried to inject dye and say, shoot, and they take a picture. Then they disappear back down into the radiology department, and you'd basically go get a cup of coffee because you never quite knew how long it was going to take for them to come back. And they come back up and they go, sorry, Dr. Lumsden, missed it. Can you do it all over again? And so that was the state of the art. I see Tom rolling his eyes there because he can identify with that. And so being able to look real time and build these vascular packages was really what put us in the game. And now that's led to a situation basically where we have highly sophisticated you know, machines in the operating room. Again, used to be, came to capital budget time and they say, Dr. Lumsden, what do you want? I'd say, ooh, I'd like a new Thompson retractor. And they go, Woo, you're an expensive guy. That costs six or seven thousand dollars. Meanwhile, the chair of radiology is saying, I want two MRI scanners, three CT scanners, submitting a package for like twenty million dollars and getting it funded. And so I think we need to understand the value and need to understand what is now basic equipment that can be brought into these operating rooms. And we're very interested in sharing this with other specialties. Uh, because I'm not going to build every one of these things, but there are many, many applications to what I'm going to show you, you know, as we move forward. The original hybrid operating room was created by this guy called Ted Dietrich, who was at the Arizona Heart Institute. He went there from Houston. How he moved into the minimally invasive world from an environment like I work in is just kind of mind-blowing. But when you look back, some of the original papers on uh, doing translumbar heliotography. The way Ted said the way he learned how to do it was Stanley Crawford, of course, is the guru of thoracic abdominal aneurysms, both Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley are up there. They were doing patients with thoracic abdominal aneurysms. They put them on their face and they just stick needles into the back until they hit the, uh, they got blood return and they inject dye. And they'd have a sausage roll of these flat plates, and you pull them out, and that was how they got into the minimally invasive world and learned the important space of being of doing diagnostic angiography. So we think of it as the imaging continuity, and so, and, and you need to be involved in all the parts of this. So one of the big things is understanding what it is that we need out of a CAT scan. Typically, in high volume radiology departments, you get a CTA of the abdomen and pelvis. You know, it's just basically a, a manufacturing system. But we really believe that understanding what questions you need answered are important, and we'll come back on to talk about this. And so being involved, involved in this image and continuity basically is very important. So let's start off with something very basic, and that is ultrasound. This is clearly the stethoscope, basically, of the future. Um, it's been used in fast scans. We don't do anything without ultrasound. We don't make an incision in the groin without using ultrasound. We don't expose a carotid artery without doing ultrasound because there is no excuse you know, in something that's available by ultrasound to make an incision in the wrong place. This idea that we don't, in my early area, we'd make an incision in the carotid and go, oh, bifurcation must be higher. 
It's not there either. Bifurcation must be lower. And so you end up basically with the patient's neck flayed. So just if there's something that every trainee in place should do is master the ability to use ultrasound. And this is really transformed. So we think of ourselves as multi-modality imagers. And using that basically at, when do, at the bedside, you know, in fast scans, when you were doing, for example, vein ablation in the lower extremity, basically it's very important to do this. So, so that's a basic. But it's also dynamic. You know, ultrasound gives you real time, shows you basically what's going on here. And so we would say to you that when we do views of an aortogram, we say one view is no view. You need at least two views to see a stenosis. Well, we'd submit to you that static imaging is no view in the cardiovascular world. Uh, aortic dissection is probably the single most dynamic disease process that we as cardiovascular surgeons deal with, and yet we take a snapshot in time. What you're looking at here is a type A dissection, hole right above the aortic valve, and that is the lumen of the ascending aorta going from completely patent to completely occluded in one cardiac cycle. You can't get that from static imaging. And if you look, for example, intraoperatively, and you see the operative uh, picture on the right, you can't see that even as you stand looking at it. Imaging will help show you that. And as we move into the endografting world, that is fundamentally important to understand basically how dynamic these structures actually are. Uh, because how, how do you choose what size of stent graft you're going to put in, in, in something like this? And what is the effect on the left ventricle? So these things basically are very, very important. And so we think now that the cardiovascular space is a very dynamic environment dynamic imaging for a very dynamic process. And if you look at the aortic dissection, you're right, in this case it's an MRI, what you're seeing, the outer crescent is the false lumen. This is where the tear has occurred in the wall of the aorta. And it's pinching off the renal artery. And again, in different phases, this is one cardiac cycle in which we're looking at the image. Understanding the flow dynamics of certain of these processes is going to be very important. The problem with, with, with CT, is, uh, with uh, MR, is you, know, you have an incredible MR group basically here at the University of Toronto, is, but you need a lot of expertise to do it. And, there, and the CT scan has much better resolution, but it doesn't really give you the dynamic processes, for example, flow that you can get out of an MR scan. And so, so understanding the power of these different types of modalities is important. This is the same patient. We can, get, we can get flow, real-time flow using 4, uh, 4D flow off the MR scan, and we can get spatial resolution off the CT scan. So we're interested in, you know, where are the holes in that septum? When you take three or four small ones, are these as the hemodynamically important as a very large uh, fenestration? And understanding this flow and what we call a false lumen, I think is the solution to try and bring that forward. And so we can fuse these together to try to get basic understanding using the strengths of both of these types of modality. And so there are many specialties represented here. This is not unique to. Uh, vascular surgery by any stretch of the imagination. Think about how you can take dynamic imaging processes and help solve some of the problems uh, that, uh, that you're challenged with on a daily basis. Now let's also talk about, everybody can see these amazing dissections which occur. And so they've traveled the world. Have you ever wondered why ultrasound has these funky looking black and white images that you're, you gotta be a magician to try and interpret? or why a CT scan basically is black and white and it's very difficult to, to interpret. And why not make, why do these scans not look anatomical? And that is really one of the processes that, are, that is going forward. And this is called cinematic rendering. Represent the anatomy like anatomy looks. And once you can do that, then you need an anatomist to interpret it. Now, I would submit to you that we are all anatomists. In fact, I was fascinated to see in the Department of Surgery that you've got a focus on anatomy. I was always been interested in anatomy, largely because I was trained in Edinburgh. You go to the United States, I think anatomy is now become an elective subject in most American medical schools. There's so little anatomy that's known. But, uh, but be, if we can relate to this and we can present these scans in an anatomical fashion, then we are much more in the game of trying to read them and to interpret them basically going forward. And so, again, part of this process is taking these images, digital images, reconstructing them so that we can look at things basically in three dimensions. 
One view is no view. This means you've got every view. You're not going to misspace anything at that point in time. And that is a revolution that I think Vasco Surdi was on the, on the forefront of as we developed endographs and started thinking about basically how we size an aortic aneurysm uh, for, um, for to place a stent graft. In the neural world, this is kind of part and parcel basically of what they've been doing for a long time. And so there's amazing discoveries that occur in one specialty that have been used in another specialty for a long period of time. And if you go look basically at a, a cerebral angiogram, they almost always basically will reconstruct this basically in 3D and increasingly basically can look at flow, you know, as that is in fact acquired. And so being able to understand that, say, I'll come back to this image in, in the bottom left, but this is, this is an endolic, this is stent graft that's inside the patient's aorta. And what we're doing is acquiring the CT scan and the way that we can see blood coming in through the L4 lumbar artery, blushing up through the aneurysm sac and going out through L3. Clearly, if you're gonna try and block this off, you're gonna target the inflow vessels rather than the outflow vessels. So, so I think stay tuned. And the importance of moving this into the CT world is we just published the, the recipe for this, is this can be done anywhere. This is not a fancy CAT scanner. It's just the way we actually acquire these images. So as we kind of move forward and looking at that, um, what I'm going to talk about now is, is to talk a little bit about how we go about merging these images basically in an operating room. So we've talked about how we acquire these images, how we look at it dynamically, how are we going to reconstruct it in a way that you and I can actually uh, fundamentally understand what's going on? And now we're going to talk about what, how I can take that image. Mrs. Smith had a CT scan that was done at potentially an outside hospital. We've already invested the radiation in that. We've already invested giving her dye. And now we want to take that and use that to, to implant a stent graft or a stent, basically, or, or stick a needle in a kidney or a liver or something like that. We don't really want to repeat the CAT scan again. And so how do we do that inside the operating room? And that's where these machines come in. So I'll let this run while I'm talking about it. The manufacturer would say, oh, Dr. Lumsden, you're looking to buy another angio suite. I said, no, I'm not. I already got an angio suite. Well, what are you doing? I'm buying a CAT scanner in an operating room. And that's what these machines fundamentally do. Some of the portable machines also do that. Uh, the portable machine that's now used with the ion for lung no nodule biopsy, it's just a portable C-arm that can do this. Think of this thing as a giant single plate detector, uh, CT detector that you move around the patient, acquires all these images, will automatically reconstruct this thing for you. But I didn't give her any dye. But what you see is the bones. You see the lumbar spine, but you also see calcifications. You know, the patients that we're operating on have bones in their blood vessel. It's visible just on an x-ray. And you can either bring, take Mrs. Smith's image from a month ago, look at the bones, fuse the bones that I see from a month ago with the bones that I see today and overlay that. That's not really what we do. As I say, we see bones in our blood vessel, so we fuse calcification to calcification, which we think is like a unique digital signature for you. Um, so, and so there's different ways in which you can import these images, overlay them on top of the patient. There are also have certain advantages basically in these machines because, you know, if your anesthesiologist falling asleep basically at the top of the table, uh, then we can waken them up with a quick dunk in the head as we move this thing around. Or we, we, if we, we go through these calisthenics with them as they try to avoid being hit by these machines as, as they go around. When I first saw that machine moving, I was just trying to imagine the chair of anesthesia right in that machine basically over and over and over. So there are some, there are some technical advantages and there's some really practical advantages in making sure your anesthesiologist is on the ball. They're a nightmare from their standpoint. And so the way that you can bring these images together is a couple of different ways. We spin that, gives you a 3D volumetric data set, it's very accurate. Increasingly now you just take two x-rays that are orthogonal planes and that allows you basically to fuse these images together. And so the reason that that's important is we're putting a stent graft in on the patient's right. It makes you say, what do I really need to know in order to deploy this? If you're gonna stick a needle in a tumor, you're gonna know where the tumor is. You need to know if there's respiratory variation. You need to know if there's cardiac variation. And there's a lot of different ways we are trying to compensate for that. In our case, we need to know where the lowest renal artery is, the bifurcation of the aorta, and where the internal iliac artery is going. You don't need to know anything else. And so it drives this discipline of what do I need to know in order to be able to do this? And what kind of fusion base am I going to utilize? And that's the way that we kind of use this imaging to bring it into the operating environment and, and try to improve the way we take care of these patients. <clears throat> so, 
I'll close out and talk a little bit about CT. In the cardiovascular world, again, first of all, no person in the right mind will look at a mitral valve and take one static image. We do it all the time with the aortic dissection. Hopefully that'll change. Second thing you do is, is use EKG gating. Again, the whole thing kind of moves. If you want, it's like having a strobe in that if you use EKG gating, you acquire the image only in diastolates when the heart is most quiescent. It gets rid of all the artifact that occurs with it. And I do think there's a significant role in acquiring these images in the cardiovascular world. And when you inject dye, it was interesting to hear this morning people talking about ischemia, is that you, there's a number of different ways you can look at how a tissue is perfused. One is to look at the dye arrival time. You inject dye through an arm to do a CAT scan. It has different times at which it arrives at the area that we are interested in. And you can plot those little circles that the radiologists draw really is measuring the time of the dye that's arriving. So if you look at the one, you know, at 11 o'clock, that's the severe cava. If you inject through the arms, it's going to arrive there pretty rapidly. And the next one is in the pulmonary artery. Clearly, we're looking for pulmonary emboli. And then the other one is in the aorta. And so when that image is acquired, just like when we injected the dye down the leg and had the CT scan, I had a, a flat plate a picture taken of our uh, FEMPOP. If you take a picture before the dye gets there, it looks like there's no flow. So understanding when the dye arrives to answer the question, this is kind of what we think really about strategic imaging in this respect. Oop, went backwards. And so, so just understanding how this works will help you enormously in terms of making sure that you get the right image. And so combining this, basically, for example, you can see dye in the left ventricle, you can see dye in the aorta, but the aorta's kind of blurry. It's kind of hard to see exactly what's going on there. But if you, you know, EKG gate at this so that we can, uh, we can acquire the arrows represent when in diastole, the CT scan is being fired and it's acquiring those images, guess what it's going to do? It's basically going to smooth this out and it's going to be a lot easier to see, same patient, different acquisition, how crystal clear the aortic dissection is, you know, in the descending thoracic aorta versus on the other side. So what I'm saying is that, you know, getting a little bit of knowledge as the surgeon who's using this information about how these things are acquired and having a partner you know, in the radiology department, in our case, based your cardiovascular imaging department, who will help optimize these scans can really help answer these questions for you. And knowing when that die arrival time is the, is the other significant part of this. And so we've we optimized this really, and I'll show you how this is done. When we have a patient who has an endograft and they have a leak around it, I don't really care what's going on in the liver, and I don't care what's going on in the spleen, I don't really care what's going on in the kidneys. All I care about is looking at the aorta. And so shortening up the area we're going to look at, and in this case you'll see this patient's going to be fired in and out of the scanner fairly rapidly in order to acquire these images, kind of like putting together a quick time movie, you can actually see these flow patterns, and then you reconstruct it, and essentially it is a quick time movie. And that, so what I'm going to show you here is essentially what this looks like, is that this is dye coming down in the aorta, that's a stent graft that's in there, and you can see dye flowing down through it, through a series of these studies. Now you can actually see the stuff right behind the, the neck of the aorta. Is that a leak that's occurring in the aneurysm sac? No, it's not. That's actually a renal vein that happens behind the aorta. But the lower one is leak coming into it. And this allows us this example of what I showed you when you put all the stuff together, and now we're looking at it, and from a volumetric standpoint, you can actually start seeing these flow patterns as blood is coming in. You can see where it's going out. And we can, not only can we understand these flow patterns, this is a little bit like an arterial venous malformation is kind of what we, what we think of this, is that we can also use this same imaging, overlay on top of the patient, draw in the path by which I'm going to try and get a catheter that goes all through the circuitous route in there. So the, the power of the CT scanner or an MR and the ability to optimize this to answer the question that you've got is, is very important from a surgical standpoint. So let me just show you a, an example, basically, of how we can put a lot of this stuff together. A little background on this. This is a patient who one of our partners had done an ascending aortic repair. The patient got chest pain postoperatively and was found to have a dehiscence of the suture line. Initially, we would try to ignore it, but then we rescanned the patient. It was getting bigger. We didn't think that was a very good idea. His patient had a fresh sternotomy. We really didn't want to uh, redo uh, the sternotomy to fix this. And came and said, can you help? And the answer is, Never done this before, but really enthusiastic. So let me see what we can actually do. And so this is taking the CAT scan. 
okay? And looking at the pseudoaneurysm, that yellow line is a measurement of depth from the sternum into the pseudoaneurysm. Now, not without its risk. These are all techniques that have been developed in the radiology department for doing biopsies. This is a thing called a needle stabilizer. There's a laser underneath that image intensifier, which you line up with the trajectory we want to put the needle in, and it shows you exactly the direction to put the needle in. You can see on, from the, on the uh, next build, you're going to see that there's a, a depth by which we can advance the needle. And we stuck it in there, we got blood back, and we thought, well, let, let's hope that we're inside the pseudoaneurysm, not inside the aorta. And then we go ahead and pack this with a bunch of embolization coils. And this patient, you know, frankly, did great. But this is, a, this is actually a relatively easy and straightforward technique. It's best done in a hybrid room. We had a you know, pump team on standby in case there was a problem with it. But understanding you know, how we interact with this imaging, not just from a diagnostic point, basically from a therapeutic point, was actually very important. And so we did the angiography, we confirmed it, and then we basically went on essentially to treat it. Now I'm going to change tax just a little bit and start talking about robotics. As I said, there's imaging, optimizing the imaging. Then there's the robots and optimizing the robotics. The holy grail, at least in my humble opinion, is bringing these two things together, importing this fused data. Okay, so I'll show you, for example, it's where we drew a line from the groin up into renal artery and told the robot, go. <clears throat> and autonomously it can track. And so the, this is the, the power really of being able to do this. The original catheter robot, which doesn't exist anymore, I'll show you why, was the Magellan robot. And I was a PI basically in the trial that got, brought that to approval. What you're looking at here is a, a patient who we had tried to catheterize the right renal artery and failed miserably. And so we brought the patient back basically, fused the images, that yellow line is the center line of the renal artery. That circle is the origin of the renal artery. And so the idea is if you line the robot up against that line, then the wire should go straight through it. And it, again, combining the control of the robot with this, and first time, you know, that wire kind of went right on through that. Now, so where it is, and that's the big robot you can see in the bottom end of the field uh, on, on, the, on the right. So where is that now? Well, it doesn't exist in the end of ASCA, the world anymore. And so, and, and I'll show you some of the examples of how this could potentially be utilized. But we'll come back to that. This is our hybrid room and this training center that we've got is a zone MRI scanner. We could take that catheter and model it. These are chips that are placed on the catheter. If you put one at the tip, four centimeters back, eight centimeters back, then we can model what that catheter looks like. And the whole idea underneath the field on the left is an electromagnetic field generator. It senses these chips and can create a model of the robot. And this really was kind of the first time ever, you can see we published this in JVS many years ago, where if you draw a center line, it's a series of, from the renal artery all the way down to the groin, it's just a series of X, Y, Z coordinates. But you better get them right, <clears throat> get them wrong, it's a bit of a problem. And then input that into the robot, press the button and say, just like a fighter pilot, navigate your way autonomously into that. And it did. It was the first time this had really ever been done. So why does this not exist anymore? And this is kind of what it looks like. This is a so-called autopilot. This is a model catheter. Uh, basically, you don't even need radiation in order to be able to do this. Bend it on its own and catheterize in that renal water. And so th this is the publication. So what happened to this? Well, what happened to this was essentially that it now exists as ours. Uh, this technology was sold to Auris. Auris is an endobronchial navigation company. And the, the decision was made a lot easier to get this into the clinical armamentarium by working inside the, uh, the bronchi than it is in working through the, um, th through the orteries. And when you think about this, a lot of us work through long, thin tubes, whether you're GI, <clears throat> whether you're a urologist, whether you're in involved in blood vessels, we're working through long, thin tubes. Same thing that the oil and gas engineers do. They'll tell you that they work, they told me, we work through long thin tubes and we are in the flow assurance business. I said, no, you're not. I said, I'm in the flow assurance business. But these technologies are all essentially the same. And this is where there's this convergence of trying to use this. And so if you look at the Auris robot, by the way, 
can't argue with the business decision. They sold this company for $4 billion four years after they took this end of ASCA robot and converted it into an end of bronchial robot. And essentially, it is, it is that Hansen robot now designed for lung nodule biopsy. And so this is one of the first steps in a massive transformation and being able to get more peripheral and being able to biopsy these lung nodules. They're all working through long, thin tubes. And the most recent iteration of this has now come from intuitive surgical. And what they do, and you'll see this, is they do exactly what we did with that uh, ascending aneurysm. They create a CAT scan, they fuse it with a preoperative CAT scan that's optimized for lung nodules, they fuse these images together, and then they draw a pathway that they can control the robot. It doesn't do it autonomously, but they control the robot, and it allows you to get much more peripheral to do lung nodule biopsies. And so if you look in your operating rooms, I guarantee you that your thoracic surgeon space, you're probably using one, one of these technologies or the interventional pulmonologist. So there's so many applications for this. Uh, and the more interest in it, then the more widespread it becomes. Now, what about being able to do this stuff remotely? All right, stents at the tip of the guide. And we are in the circumflex um, puff here, guys. So this, you can turn that down, down a little bit. So this was the first transcontinental uh, catheterization, uh, cardiac catheterization using a similar robot. The, the robot that exists in the end of Asker space, the only one that exists is called Corindus. It was actually bought by Siemens. It's not near as technologically advanced as the Hansen robot was, but it's all they got. And the question is, can you do this stuff remotely? The first PCI was actually done you know, in, uh, in India, and it was all done kind of remotely. So why is that important? Okay, nobody's going to do remote PCI. Every time we turn around, there's a cardiologist somewhere. We don't need more cardiologists in that right now. And so, but come back over into the neurospace. If you look basically at the neurospace, then all the clinical trials have shown that the most efficacious way of treating a patient with a thrombotic occlusion for a stroke is to remove the, the thrombus, which is great if you live in Toronto or you live in Houston. There's not a problem doing that. Removing clot from a patient that's having a stroke is the single most cost-effective intervention that's been described in medicine. Because they don't kill you. It just maims you, you know, for the rest of your life. So how do we generalize that? And so one of the things I've been working with is with Gavin Bretz, who's our chair of neurosurgery. He's kind of a, a, a vascular kind of guy. Is can you take these robots and actually use them to navigate up into the head remotely? And so this is kind of the first case. Typical neurosurgeon, he'd never even seen this before. I show him how to use the robot, and within 10 minutes, he's telling me how to do the procedure. And then, okay, <laughs> you know, it tells you something. <laughs> um, and so, so we've been working on this with the multiple publications that have come out really looking at how you can control these microcatheters. The, the robot is not optimized for, uh, for intracranial work, has been completely re-engineered. And the entire premise of this is can you perform remote stroke intervention? Could you set up a network related to your stroke center where you revascularize and ship the patient basically if need be in order to be able to do that? And this is kind of this huge unmet clinical need. Now the fact that it's such an expensive um, event if a patient has a stroke, there's huge amounts of money being invested in this at the moment. So as I say, what happened was that you know, Siemens bought Corindus. Their vision is exactly what I've been talking about, bringing the robotics, bringing the imaging, bringing them together, and increasingly, can actually this actually be done remotely? And I think the answer to that is, technically, it's going to be able to be done. Can you deliver these different thrombectomy devices basically up into the head? This is all being delivered in a model with the robot, and it certainly can be delivered. Uh, lots of logistics in terms of being able to do this. Um, can you do this wirelessly? Uh, we've tested that in the lab using simply a long cable, then disconnecting the cable, going through a 5G network. Uh, none of this has been done in humans yet, by the way. This has all kind of been done essentially in models. And, and what kind of latency can we actually tolerate? And the next component basically is to move. This is kind of me doing kind of a weird dance, but you'll see what that is, is what I'm looking at is the controller for that robot in VR. That doesn't exist. You know, and I'm operating these controls. In theory, somebody could be sitting in this audience doing a, you know, doing a stroke intervention in a patient in Houston. And the way that this is being translated is being translated into some robotic controllers that can just be applied. These are the robotic controllers on top of the Corindus platform. Again, using the imaging, using VR, 
building this thing in VR and testing this ability to, do, uh, to perform remote stroke intervention. So that's kind of where I think catheter robots are going. And again, these robots exist in the oil and gas world. They're using robots way underground. Some of them are autonomous, some of them are not autonomous. If you talk about robotics in space, then I'll come and we've got time to show you some of the examples of how NASA and SpaceX are going to be using robots. Now, these next few slides are largely to stimulate my vascular colleagues. I think we've missed the boat, you know, on robotics. And so we're fortunate in that we have a great thoracic group. 95% of what our thoracic surgeons are doing are now being done with an XI robot. But they're in our operating rooms, and I run the operating rooms. So I get to walk into anybody's room. And I walk in one day, and I went, what, what, what is that? They said, oh, this is what you see when you put a scope into the left chest. They haven't done anything other than just put a scope with visualization in the left chest. That's the left carotid. That's our current laryngeal. That's the left subclavian. And that's that big beaten thing there happens to be the aorta. They've done no dissection. It's just there. And of course, I'm like, oh my gosh, have a, could I have a needle and a wire and a catheter? Can I put an endocyte stent graft in there? We got inflow. It's sitting there for us to figure this out. And I would submit to you that that's one of the challenges that, uh, you know, we've dumbed down the people who come to us and say, ah, you're never going to use this. Uh, the endovascular world, we've given up core efficacy. Debakey developed, that's another interesting story. Dacron, which we used to replace the aorta, was discovered by Debakey, but not really. He went to a department store in downtown Houston said, I'm looking for Vignon N, which had been used, I think it was NYU, for a replacement of an aneurysm. And the clerk said, now we're out of Vignon N, Dr. DeBakey. <clears throat> and he said, well, what else you got? She said, we've got this stuff called polyester or Dacron, rolls of this for dressmaking. And he looked at it and said, well, well that might work. Why don't you give me some of that stuff? <clears throat> I kid you not. <clears throat> he took it home. He sewed it up on his wife's sewing machine. There's a great picture of him doing that. He sterilized it and using the patient the next day. <clears throat> And that's what we use to this day. I had the chance to say, him, Dr. DeBakey, did you get IRB approval? He said, absolutely. I was the IRB. I said it was OK. So there are certain things we'd kind of like to get back to, but we're probably a long way from it. <clears throat> and so what we have done in the vascular surgery world is the, the putting in a piece of Dacron, let this run in the background, is the single most durable repair of an aortic aneurysm. But the delivery system, big open operation, pretty bad. <clears throat> What we've done is given up the core therapeutic part for the sake of a delivery system. And I think this is a median archaic ligament syndrome. It's one of my partners, you know, dissecting that out. And the question is, can we get back into this, maintain that core efficacy while changing the way we deliver that therapy? I think it's going to be very important going forward. And again, different types of imaging. Again, every general surgeon here probably knows about Firefly and how they can look at perfusion. If you're going to do a hepatic resection, you ligate the left hepatic artery. You basically put in some endocyanine green. This is all built into the intuitive system. They see where they're going to do the resection, where the blood flow ends. We talked about ischemia and tumors this morning. There are all of these different ways that are going to be important in trying to determine blood supply. And this can be incorporated really into this. So I'm going to show this as we continue this evolution. The theme is imaging. And using imaging, in this case, education, and patient-specific animation a little bit easier. You can turn up the volume on this, please. Mm. It's a cinematic rendering format that makes it look uh, very anatomical. And we believe in anatomical imaging. So here you can see we've gone from the patient's skin surface all the way down through the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It lies just deep to it. And we can show the center lines of the internal and external carotid artery. And we can show that superimposed in the skin. And all of this kind of helps planning. In the future, we may be able to do optical fusion. So this 3D DICOM data set has traditionally been used um, the company's called Materialize. They use Mimic software to extract 3D data, and this is used for making um, uh, printing 3D models. We believe this is probably going to be um, obsolete in the future, and this will all be done uh, digitally. However, this is the first time ever that Mimic software has been used to extract data uh, relevant to a patient to create and drive a patient a specific animation. So this is an example of how this data set can be extracted. It was transmitted to um, uh, Bruce Blousen, runs Blousen Medical Animations, and they use 3DS, which is a animation software from Autodesk. And 
they use this to segment out the appropriate structures that instead of having to build all these models in wire form format from scratch, they can actually use this as a, uh, as a starting point. The whole idea of this is can we make it more specific, can we make it faster, and can we make it cheaper to create these animations for education of both patients and potentially um, of uh, future surgeons. So this is what it looks like when we import that 3D data set into uh, 3DS Max uh, by uh, Autodesk. And once that's in there, it of course saves the animators a lot of time. Here you can see it in wireframe format. They can highlight it. The tools, of course. So I'm going to go on through this. If you really want to look at the whole video, that's kind of also up on our YouTube channel. But what it allows you to do is build models. These models can then be shown to a patient or they can be imported into a VR environment. Again, the advantage of VR and 3D reconstruction is you can interact basically with these models. And this is an area that kind of we are actively pursuing both from an educational standpoint and the clinical application. And what has really changed about this is the uh, Oculus Quest is 300 bucks. Okay, you, you can afford to buy these and send them out uh, device companies to spend more on your airfare than this. Instead, we can potentially take that out to them. And companies are beginning to use this idea of scanning the, the data, importing it into a VR environment, and then building training. And this is an example, basically, from Endologics of, that's me, believe it or not. And a proctor is going to be standing opposite me. He happens to be in Phoenix, and, he's, and we're teaching us how to use these devices. We scan the devices, okay? We can put your devices in a CT scanner, and come out with a 3D reconstruction basically of the devices, which can then be imported based into these animation models. And you know, they, this is remarkably effective. Orthopedics tends to be leading the way in developing these VR environments. I'll show you a few examples of this. But this is a, a very effective way of training you on sequences. What it hasn't had is haptic feedback, but even that is, is, is changing. And you can see how this prompts you as you walk along this process. And shortly, this guy appears on the other side who can critique you and tell you really how to do this as you go along. So orthopedics, you know, the company we've worked with is called Fundamental Surgery. Uh, these machines, which are you know, genetically available, can give you haptic feedback. You can actually feel what's happening as you, as you use these different tools. And anatomy, this is an example of how anatomy is going to be taught in the future. This is a prisoner who was, had a CT scan, who was reconstructed. This is using a Vario headset, which is more like the, the Rolls Royce, really, of, um, of mixed reality systems. And you can label this. You'll see how you do a heart transplant. You just put your hand inside the guy's chest and, and rip his heart out is essentially what happens here. But this ability to create, and remember, obviously, this stuff is as bad today as it's ever going to be. It is almost scary where this is going to go in the future, but it will fundamentally transfer. There you go, heart transplant. I you know, hope the reimbursement doesn't change, but uh, you know, but that's one way to do it. And everything is labeled, and we can teach anatomy. You know, as we go through this, this is kind of where you know you get this haptic feedback. I've done a knee replacement, kind of fun now. Actually, done a hip replacement. Um, you know, the money must be in orthopedics because these are not cheap models to develop, but basically they're, they've always essentially been developed up front for orthopedics, and the, oh, there's only one that I know exists in the vascular surgery world. What we've done with this is that the, our training center was shut down basically during COVID, and we, so we wanted to build a VR environment, you know, by which we could train people. And this is, we call this the Mightyverse. Um, Mighty, it was the training center, Mightyverse. One shooter of Meta was going to be mad at us for, for, for copying them. Actually, they approached us recently are coming down to visit uh, to look at this. And it's a way by which we can incorporate the videos that we've created. 3D reconstruction that we've made off these CT scans, uh, and both virtually, these surgeons we can bring in here from anywhere in the world as long as you've got an internet connection. The sitting on top of that podium is an aortic aneurysm. That CT scan is used both to create 3D models, but you're gonna, that's also what you've got here. And people can grab it, rotate it, and discuss it, and plan a case. Guess what? When oil and gas guys do a uh, drill, they actually uh, we'll plot that in the 3D environment. They'll bring in the experts from around the world to wherever is adjacent to their offices, and they collaborate basically in case planning, basically just like this. So this is an incredibly important, you know, educational option. 
We've also been scanning devices. And the reason we've been scanning devices, first of all, the companies wouldn't give us their CAD drawings, but we can get it. We can just stick it in a CAT scanner. We can make pictures, CT scans, of stink grafts, you know, of uh, LVADs, because when we talk about image fusion and bringing them together, it doesn't need to be the same patient. You can take an image of an of a LVAD, and you can take a patient's heart, and we can virtually implant that. And I'll, and I'll show you a couple of examples of this as I kind of draw towards the end here. This is, these are CT scans that we've made. You know, in this case, is the self-expanding sutureless heart valve. You can implant it virtually into this and basically see how it fits and then validate that, basically the time to do the operation. Uh, we've kind of built an app by which all of these devices are housed. And so part of it is to train AI algorithms to automatically identify what the devices are. And if you can do that, can you automatically identify if there's a problem with the device? So for example, you know, the inferior vena cable filters, notorious now for fracturing, pieces can end up in the heart. And here you can see what you're looking at is, is us basically taking one of these uh, pieces out that's broken off. We got the filter out. The red is the piece we're taking out the audit wall. We put it back together, rescan it. We can compare what it should look like versus to make sure that we've got all the pieces there. These are the kind of things that can really be done you know, with these various different components uh, and, and knowing having a digital library of medical devices uh, that we can, we can look at it. Perhaps the best example was we're approached by our Heart failure surgeon say, we've got to put an evad in this patient. Uh, the patient's been operated on. We're going to have to go through the apex and make a small incision. Can you help design this? We scanned the left ventricular assist device. What we did then basically was look at the heart itself. And essentially, we virtually implanted this. All of those coordinates for the direction of this can be put into our hybrid room. The hybrid room will draw that. We got that line. We want. Remember, I showed you how the laser can point down that line. Then they can do a minimally invasive approach and make sure, basically, this is optimally positioned. And coming to the end, basically, we're going to talk about how computer vision in our operating room is going to change everything that we do. Uh, and, and Appella, basically, is an example, really, of that. These are cameras which are up on the wall. If you look at Tesla, Tesla, and a lot of this has been driven by another, yet another industry, and that industry is the car industry. As a Tesla drives along the street, they have ultrasound sensors, they have computer vision, they may or may not have radar basically built into them, and all of that is being programmed automatically. They've got to identify the pedestrian, they've got to identify the street sign, a stopped car, they even identified the wetness of the road. And the investment in this has really transformed what we can get out of computer vision. And so this is an example, looks very like a Tesla, if you look at the data that really is in there, of how we are tracking what is going on in our operating rooms. You know, that these boxes are automatically being drawn. The whole idea of this really is to show, um, optimize the use of the operating rooms, automatically take or tell Dr. Feeling's patients prep and drape and you're ready for you to come in there. And so I think this, that we're using this for fall prevention in our ICU. Uh, can you identify the motions that predicts the patient is at risk of falling and automatically alert the patient? This is going to transform what we do. I'm not going to go into pumps and pipes, but let me just kind of talk about this a, a little bit as a concept um, and give you an example of how the other person's toolkit is very important. Laser Greenfield was a surgeon in the University of Michigan. Um, he was having dinner with his next door neighbor. I'm sure there was alcohol involved, probably good scotch. And as they kind of reminisced on their day, and the laser said, a terrible day. And the terrible day was because this young man, he was, had multiple injuries three days ago. Uh, we operated on save time, but he dropped dead today from a pulmonary embolism. And then his next door neighbor, who happened to be an oil services pipeline engineer, said, how'd that happen? He said, well, the two tubes come over the leg, one tube goes up to the heart. He said, well, put a sieve, put a sieve in that, in that thing, a uh, filter in that. And the laser said, you mean like a sieve? You mean like a horizontal sieve? He said, you can't, you can't put a sieve in a pipeline. You broke the whole pipeline off. I said, well, what should you do? He said, you need to exploit laminar flow, fastest flow is center line. That's how you catch these particles. And that's how the original feed vena cable filter was developed. It had the physician who identified the problem. You had the engineers or the scientists who helped solve that problem. And then you had a guy called John Abley, who was one of the founders of Boston Scientific, who helped develop a business out of that. And that's the holy triumvirate in being able to do this. But being able to connect with people who are outside your specialty, particularly the scientists and the engineers, is very important. I always start this off by saying it's an exercise in communication. We speak different languages. That's what the surgeon scientists really can do. You can be the translators from our problems to help 
the engineers and the scientists understand what our problem is and to translate from the scientists back. Because I always say, we may look like we're meeting together, but you look at them in that different dimension and we miss. And those are huge opportunities that are missed. So having these collisions that occur between people who share the passion, but are often speaking a different language, I think is very important. And I think that's what this surgeon scientist group are essentially uh, fundamental in helping with that communication process. So it's a huge pleasure to have been invited here to talk today. Uh, and I look forward to any questions over lunch and, and thank you again for the invitation. I'm very humbled by it. Thank you. <laughs> Wow. Well, we have time for uh, a few questions. If, if there are anything, everybody's sort of like, mm. wow, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool. So um, have you seen any applications for spine surgery? So, uh, <laughs> so, so one of the original um, topics in Pumps and Pipes was docks and rocks, OK? And the rocks really were the uh, geological guys, the geophysicists. But we deal with rocks. You're in dealing with rocks. Whether you like it or not, you're, you're, you're dealing with rocks. And you know, the, the, the groups you know, that deal with mineralogy more than anybody else, and also deal with metal fatigue, which is a problem basically that you have in some of those pedicle screws, is, is in the oil and gas business. They're the ones who know more about metal fatigue. When, and here's, here's another interesting thing, is when you hear about a pipeline rupturing, is it metal fatigue? It's because the pipeline is infected. Now, there's a novel concept, OK? How on earth do you get a piece of metal that gets infected? Well, we get this all the time. What happens in the pipelines is that they have, just like you saw this morning with the carotid artery, when you have areas of low shear, you get buildup inside these pipelines. When you get buildup up in the pipeline, you get micro colonies of self-hydro-producing bacteria, which converted in sulfuric acid, which dissolves the wall of the pipeline. That's a billion dollar a year problem, you know, in the oil and gas business that they can't quite figure out. They're very interested when we can use antibiotic, antibiotic targeting, imaging, all of these kind of things that they use to identify. And they're very interested in how we can sterilize structures that they can't. Tom. Great. Uh, Alan, a real tour de force and so many questions that come to mind. But I'm, I'm just, um, as you were talking, I just, Agree so wholeheartedly of taking you know, our static images and then going through sort of a sort of a, a non-static environment. I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on. You talked about gated, you know, gating with respect to cardiac cycle. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about respiratory motion, mm -hmm. and then the other motion. Basically, we're doing our imaging with a patient in an artificial environment. We're putting them supine. Yep. You and I are are vertical most of the day. What about? mimicking gravity and looking at other forces with respect to So I don't quite know how to mimic gravity yet. Um, the cardiac gate, we'll work on it. We'll talk to the NASA people and see if they can they get solutions for that. We could put you up in, up in space. That's a whole other set of issues in terms of uh, how that affects your organs. Um, the cardiac gating is largely done because of EKG gating. The respiratory gating is fascinating, actually. In fact, if you look in, on the roof of that uh, imaging lab, where there are lasers up on the roof, and this is another example of coming from somebody else. If you talk to your radiation oncologists, okay, they're going to radiate a lung nodule. Well, these patients have COPD. They don't want to radiate the lung. They want to radiate the nodule. And so what they do basically is do real-time imaging of the CT scanner to see how that lung nodule moves up and down with respiration. And they correlate that with, with wall, chest wall motion. Those scanners are looking at chest wall motion. And they're turning the radiation beam on only during certain phases where that lung nodule could be in there. So there's lots of interest in, in correction for respiratory motion, cardiac motion, and deformation, which is a big issue that you and I have, you know, because your, your blood vessel in there, we stick a giant tube up through it, and the whole thing doesn't look anything like you start with. So a lot of work really being done on that. Great question. Perfect. Well, I think maybe on that note, we'll uh, break for lunch. We'll have discussions over... Yeah. Lunch and then we'll uh, lunch awaits us outside and then we'll reconvene at uh, twelve thirty for our special symposium on artificial intelligence and advanced uh, imaging as drivers of surgical innovation. Professor Lumsden, thank, thank you, you so much. My pleasure. Tour thank de you. force. Thank you.